Good morning, everybody. How are we? Who understands beef and Bitcoin? We've been doing this for a while, guys, so we're going to have a great chat today. Thanks for being here. I'm going to basically uh, turn it over to Brianna Sagdahl. She is our senior writer, uh, research analyst, I Am Texas Slim Foundation. She has decades of experience in agriculture in the United States. Of course, we have Cole Bolton. He's one of the uh, pioneering ranchers, producers, processors in the Beef Initiative. And of course, we have Elizabeth Murphy with us today from Weston A. Price. So we're going to be rapid fire here. We're going to talk about sovereignty and how does beef and Bitcoin play in this into our lives moving forward, where we came from, where we sit now, and where are we going. Brianna, thank you. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning. We're nervous. Uh, I'm used to looking at cows, so this is a whole lot of a huge different experience for me. Uh, most of us up here are pretty uncomfortable and the spotlights are not fun. So look, we're really hoping to engage you guys. Um, we're, in, we're in some really hard times right now. Um, we're losing 27,000 farms per year. Our farmers are getting decimated right now. And we're hoping that you guys will have some ideas and that you might want to uh, maybe partner with us, create some different liquidity options. And so today we're here to talk about the importance of the cattle industry and why it is that what we do matters to you guys. First and foremost, this is not just about cows. This is about land. First and foremost, it's about land. Secondly, it's about food security, and that is a national security issue right now. So we need your guys' help, and we're hoping that you guys will be uh, warm and inviting and help us out. And so we're just gonna we're gonna have a, a couple back and forth questions. And if anybody has questions from the audience, you guys wanna uh, you know come up here, engage with us. We'd love that too. We honestly don't know what we're doing up here, so help us out. <laughs> so so first up, I want to talk about liquidity deficits. Um, we've had a lot of really bad policy passed in the last three years. Uh, specifically, the CCC was just tapped to incorporate something called the voluntary carbon market. And this is a large uh, line of credit that we in rural America count on. And our capital, our liquidity is drying up. So we're thinking, you know, maybe Bitcoin and some savvy investors have some good ideas about maybe using Bitcoin for uh, entry points into the cattle industry. Maybe there's some good ideas for investment into cow-calf operations. And then what we do best, Slim, tell them what we do best. Well, we're the source of the seed of basically, you know, uh, making all this happy. Uh, we're the vertical integration, that phrase is used a bunch in the uh, multinational, basically, uh, language. But what we are is we're from soil to fork. So we bring you from basically the supermarket to soil to fork, the vertical integration of the cattle industry, truth and food through beef and Bitcoin. Yep. And we help facilitate direct to consumer. How many? Okay. So, so first and foremost, just last question here. Um, how many people here in this audience know where their food is coming from when you go to the grocery store? Okay. <laughs> I see my son in the way back because he pre <laughs> he grows it and processes it <laughs> himself, <laughs> so a little different. But but most of our most of the food that we have available to us today is coming from out of the country. We're a net importer, um, and so anyways, with that, I want to turn it over. Cole, can you can you help illustrate some of the liquidity issues uh, that we're dealing with today? Well, uh, one of the biggest changes is the, you know, the generational wealth shift. The average age of a, of a rancher in the United States now is 69 years old, and young people aren't going back into the industry. A large portion of that is due to uh, immense capital requirements. Um, I work three jobs. I own a processing plant. I run the cattle ranch. I have a meat company, and then I actually do have a full Monday through Friday eight to five job. Um, 
<clears throat> it's what gave me the start and helped me to build that liquidity. But the majority, and it's no different than young people trying to go out and get a house right now. Hell, a whole lot of us don't have the cash to put down, especially if you're in some of these, these urban markets where our real estate prices got stupid. Same thing's happening in rural America where you take a piece of dirt that's 100 acres and was $5,000 an acre uh, three, four years ago. Now it's 12, 15, 20,000. Once it gets to that 5,000 range at that point, we're not making it make money on agriculture. We're now real estate investors figuring out a way to have a utilization tool both for taxes and uh, to make other sources of revenue, hence why we get into ranching. Um, one of the biggest needs young people or anyone really trying to get into the industry um, is to find some, is to design some programs to where they have access to appropriate capital to grow an operation. Sounds really cool in the news. You hear about grants where they're you know giving Joe Blow the farmer ten thousand dollars. Well, not to be rude, but ten thousand dollars don't get you anywhere in our industry. <laughs> um, uh, it's really nice, but if you can't grow to scale, you're not going to make it a living. It's just going to be a glorified hobby. Thanks, Cole. And whenever I first started the Beef Initiative, I basically, and I want everybody to raise their hand if you have an answer, but where is the store of the value of the cow right now? I can tell you the store of the value of the cow throughout the history of the United States. Where's the store of the value of our land now? Well, it's basically the store of the value of the cow is in the USDA insurance policy. As Cole just said, you know, most ranchers have to become real estate agents. We have to basically become uh, looking at cattle as tax write-offs. Our food industry, especially the cattle industry, is now nothing more than a tax write-off. It's a USDA insurance policy write-off. This is what the American people do, does not understand at this time until we can reverse that trend of putting the store of the value back into the land itself, back into the cow itself, then we're going to be basically liquidated out of our own food supply. We're going to be liquidated out of our own cattle industry. We are now a net importer of beef in the United States. How does that happen? 80% of our beef that we eat in the United States is foreign beef, and we don't even know where it's coming from. It doesn't have a country of origin labeling on there. We do not know where we're eating, no matter if it says organic, grass-fed, natural. It doesn't matter anymore. Until we can really focus where the store of the value of our food supply is with a certain type of technology that we're all here about, that we're still going to be guessing as far as being able to have the liquidity as a young rancher or even a generational rancher in the United States of America to even start a herd. $10,000 won't get you a slap in the face whenever you're a cattle rancher. So how do we get that liquidity back? We start identifying where the store of the value of our land and our cow is. That comes from everybody out here. This comes from consumer demand. Yeah, so consumer demand is a big part of it, policy is a big part of it, liquidity is a big part of it, and we're really hoping that you guys will partner with us and help us create some awesome, innovative, private, innovative solutions to tackle some of these, honestly, public policy failures. And uh, with that, I'm going to graciously welcome uh, Elizabeth Murphy, who, if you guys don't know what West on a Price is, it's one of the most amazing foundations. We're so excited to have Elizabeth with us. And, and not only is she with West on a Price Foundation, but she also works right here in Tennessee with our lawmakers, or with your lawmakers anyways. And uh, she's fighting for everybody here, for all of your guys' rights to access good, clean, healthy food, for you guys to have the opportunity to eat what it is that you want. With that, Elizabeth, what do you think is one of the biggest problems that we're facing today? And, um, and, and what do you see um, happening as a result of some of these big policies that are costing us our farms right now? So I guess when I think about the biggest issue, it's for me, it's a coming issue. So right now in Tennessee code and in many codes across the United States, I have not dug into all veterinary code, it's a project I'm working on, but here in Tennessee, our state commissioner of ag and our state veterinarian have the authority, if they deem it necessary for the greater good, to come onto your land cause you to either cull your entire herd or force you to give a vaccine. And if you don't obey, it's a $1,000 penalty per animal. 
So one of the things we did at Weston Price last year was we ran a bill. We knew it wasn't going to pass. It was too out there. But we ran a bill that made it to where if you were a farmer who had never vaccinated, because right now there's no mRNA beef shots. They're coming. They're already in pig. They're already in salmon. They're being developed. And so we ran the bill really as a way to raise awareness that this is in code, that right now there's entities who are not elected, they're appointed, who can call you what to do with your private property. And with the, uh, <laughs> the coming push for lab-grown meat, for plant-based, all of that, I think the biggest issue is how are they going to attack the cattle and the integrity of the herd to where the herd is not as vibrant, where we have mass cattle die-offs. So that's my personal scary thing right now to be looking at. Thanks, Elizabeth. And so as we lose, like we were kind of chatting in the car on the way here, right? And as we lose 27, 30,000 farms per year, we also lose our representation. We lose our voice. We lose our vote. And each time that we lose people in rural America, these districts are redrawn around increasingly urbanized areas. So we're left without a voice, we're left without a vote, and we have no way of voting in opposition, or honestly, anybody who knows our industry. You guys want to take a wild guess how many of us are left out here? Anybody want to take a wild guess? What percentage of the population, those of us still farming and ranching, make up? Less than 2%, that's right. So. One, we're up against a huge educational deficit because people have an idea about what we do, but they don't know what it looks like. They're not, they, they really don't know what it is that we do. And so part of what we're working on um, as, as a coalition of individuals on this stage, part of it is just to educate people on what it is that we do and get you guys engaged. Um, because our food supply is important. It, it, even if you don't eat meat, Right? You still eat some something, and food is the found, you know, building block of life, gotta have it. Um, I mean, we're, we're even losing herds um, on BLM land, which is probably a talk for another time, but food security is national security, right? So, um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're really trying to educate the public. We're trying to engage people, bring them in, get them excited about farming and ranching again. Like, get people excited to homestead. Get people excited to, to grow a garden and learn how to process. Um, Cole, you want to talk about um, processing or, or butchery or anything? Yeah, the, the uh, real, real fun part of it is kind of the, actually more of the dirty part of the industry, but... I got this harebrained idea a few years ago during COVID. Um, our little meat company had grown so much, so I thought, you know, there, there's definitely a need for more processors. Um, our country is short with small processors, so we decided to jump off and build one right in the middle of COVID. Uh, everything, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, processing supplies come from China, so that was really frustrating uh, during COVID. But, um, you know, we, my little plant, we harvest about 50 to 75 head of cattle a week. Um, normally, we cut about 10,000 pounds every single day. Um, you know, as far as the difference that we make in our own local community, I employ 26 employees uh, in our little bitty uh, town of Luling, Texas. But um, more and more of these are starting to pop back up. So many of them have had their challenges. Like in Texas right now, we're seeing record cattle prices, and it's encouraging ranchers because, as she said earlier, most there's only a small number of us. And I also made the comment that if you're not moving numbers, you're doing this for a hobby. The majority of our producers now are hobby ranchers and farmers. And not that it's a bad thing, but those folks are taking their cattle to the auctions right now, and they're not wanting to harvest them. So once again, we finally got more plants built in the United States because, uh, or really over the last four years, and then now they're having hell in the southern states getting, getting animals into those facilities. Uh, they're selling them too quick, and more importantly, we need direct-to-consumer uh, demand. So all of my customers are taking their, their animals to the public. They're trying to sell them, or they're putting it in their own freezer. Um, 
but we've got to have, well, I've been focused on trying to help them find an outlet for their own beef and to help keep it moving because obviously it keeps our plant busy too but um, yeah the processing industry is uh, it's it's a lot different I went from sitting in corporate America uh, for a big commercial bank to being on a kill floor and shoveling cow manure and blood and all kinds of stuff but um, we kind of get a little bit of Get to do a little bit of all that, but I don't want to eat our time up, uh, literally, um, telling you all about beef uh, processing. So. <laughs> it's a big part of what we do. It's a really big part of what we do. And one thing to build on what Cole just said, uh, we live in Texas. Uh, Texas has 254 counties, okay? At one time in my lifetime, we had 254 microprocessing centers. This is what we've lost. And then Cole just brought up the fact that well, we've got more processing centers, more microprocessings, but this is the vertical integration. Those processing centers don't stay in business if the producers are not bringing their throughput through those microprocessing centers. We get manipulated at many levels in the cattle industry. During COVID, we got manipulated at the retail market, okay? Retail side of beef went really skyrocketed, and that was JBS manipulating retail market prices. They were fined $56 million, but they made a profit of $500 million in less than 18 months during COVID. Now we're getting record prices at the basically the auction houses, which is wholesale beef. So now it's being manipulated the wholesale side. Okay, whenever I talk about vertical integration, that's knowing where your food comes from, from soil to the forage to the cow to the producer, to the processor, to distribution, to your plate. Okay, that's what we used to do in the United States of America, and this is how they cause confusion within the general public because we don't understand how food is produced or distributed anymore. So until we can get consumer demand, we get, as Brianna said, more awareness, more understanding about how did the Midwest once at a point in time we did feed the world in a certain point in certain uh basically gravity right now we don't feed the world folks they made our food in the united states highly subsidized and highly profitable okay what's going on towards all the coding all the legislation the local laws everything's coming after to attack independent farmers and producers in the United States of America because we are now a multinational food system. What happens when we don't have producers and ranchers anymore to grow our beef? What happens when we don't have ranchers and producers that actually follow regenerative practices that basically let us have a hundred years of legacy of being able to have our own food supply? That's what they took away from us. That's what we're raising our hand and saying, hey, we need help. We need people to invest in food supply systems. In my hometown of Canyon, Texas, I live right in the belly of the beast of the multinational system. 85% of all beef in the state of Texas comes through my part of the country. Okay, we don't get to eat any of our local beef except through a partnership that I have with Justin Trammell of Trammell Cattle and Panhandle Meat. We now feed a 30 mile radius out of a rancher's storefront. We have people coming all the way from Amarillo, Texas, 30 mile radius coming to our storefront, establishing that relationship with us because they know where the cows are grazed. They know what type of forage inputs those cows are having. They're not questioning mRNA vaccines. They're not questioning too many antibiotics, steroids and everything. We're basically getting back to the vertical integration of clean and pure food to where we're not feeding an industry that has been so damn polluted with this fiat debt. I come from agricultural poverty. That agricultural poverty started in 1971 when we went off the gold standard. I lived through farm aid in the 80s. Right now, what we have going on in the United States is going to be a food shift like we witnessed in the 70s. This is what's happening on a macro level and a micro level. This is what is hard to identify. That's why we have to start understanding where's the store of the value of our food. It's not in a label, but it's been designed by a lobbyist for a multinational corporation. It's through relationship building that's basically about sound money, sound communications, sound food for a sound future 
basically that we all collaborate into. That's the consumer demand. It's just not following a marketing plan anymore. It's basically creating your own food supply through herd shares, CAFOs, microprocessing center is the solution to feed your local communities. And this is what we're bringing back in the beef initiative. We're now consulting on microprocessing centers in Texas and across the United States. This is gonna be the next level of the beef initiative. And this is what Brianna brought up. We're looking for people to basically see the value of being able to create your own food supply with relationships like Cole Bolton, who has processing centers that can build these herds that actually most of the American population in the next 24 months is going to be raising their hand and saying, how can I be a part of this? It's a lot of information. Whenever I started the Beef Initiative, I came up with a phrase. I said, it's time to get back to the source of the seed of where we came from. Okay, we have to start learning a new pattern language when it comes to food, folks. What happens? I asked today, when the Bitcoin basically group, the Bitcoin collaboration, Bitcoin don't care. We have to remember that. Bitcoin is new technology. Okay, it's a technology that can save agriculture in the United States of America. It's a technology that builds decentralized conversations that actually build the industry. I didn't know Cole Bolton four years ago. We've built together. He's a pioneering rancher producer into the beef initiative. We now have 250 producers across the United States that have come in voluntarily because they see the value of decentralizing our food supplies back to where we, which we came from. Go ahead, Brianna. I just wanted to end by talking about KYC. Yeah, you that's guys perfect. all have your, uh, your idea of KYC and Bitcoin. We have ours too, and it's called Know Your Cow. This is really what we're fighting for. We want you to come get to know your cow. Come buy a piece, come buy a herd share, own a half of a cow, a quarter cow, Come partner with us. Come help us develop the next herd, the next generation of cattle in America. Come help us secure our food security and make sure that everybody in this country is fed. So we want you to KYC. Come know your. Come get to know your cow. We want to come. We want you to come and shake our hand. We want to get to know you guys. We want to bring you guys in. Like we said, there's only 2% of us, less than 2% of us left doing what we're doing. So we want you guys to come see what we do. We want you to come get to know our operations. We want to invite you guys in. Um, lots of us have B&Bs or Airbnbs on our property. You know, just see what it is that we do every day in rural America and get to know the process, feel comfortable with it. We don't need dragnet, RFID, you know, surveillance. Um, we don't need to track and trace every hoof print or anything like that. What we need is to get back, like Slim says, to the source of the seed. We want you guys to take control. This is your self-governance moment. This is your Vi moment. Because we either sit around and we wait for the nanny state to take control or we have that thy moment and we decide that this is our generation's time to take back our sovereignty and our control and we self-govern. Yes. And it's okay to basically not ask for permission, folks. Quit asking for permission to feed yourself the best food on the planet. Okay, that's just something that is a God-given right for you to steward your own food supply. So the, the, the type of stuff you see on social media, I'll make this very fast. It's a bunch of anxiety. It's a bunch of fear porn, folks. Go shake your rancher's hand. Get to understand the industry. Build those relationships. We have ranchers and producers out there in the United States right now. Come through the gates of the Beef Initiative. Welcome to beef.com. Learn these phrases, source of the seed, shakerranchershand.com. Welcome to beef.com, beefnews.com. 
beefsupport.com. All of these things are basically tools and platforms that are decentralized that have a store of value back into agriculture in the United States of America. We have legacy, basically foundations, Weston A. Price, one of the best foundations in the United States of America. Become partners with all of these foundations that are basically trying to make you healthy and make you prosper within your own food supplies. Our children in the United States are being cheated right now because of an adult consumer demand. Let's switch that. It starts with basically a decentralized currency monetary system that has a store of value. Come find out who we are. Be curious. Ask questions. Innovate with us. Quit asking for permission to basically lead the new modern day cattle industry in the United States of America because there's, there's no borders here, folks. This is a global industrial food shift. Yeah, you got a question? Let's get regenerative cattle going again. All right, we got just a minute. Thank you so much. I just wondered can we get beef shakes? <laughs> well, no, it's the whole soy boys and all that, you know. Can we get beef shakes, you know, like a little meat shakes? You can do raw milk, egg yolks, really? lamb liver that you soak in the raw milk for 24 hours and then blend it up with some maple syrup, some cinnamon. Tastes just like eggnog. You can't taste the liver. So try it. You're welcome. All right. Thanks for the question. The new protein shake is raw milk. So there you go. We've got Find your market access to raw milk. That's a start. Find your market access to butter. Find your market. Go ahead up there. Yeah, guys, have you considered a private-based organization so that you won't be subject to this insanity uh, with relation to regulations and USDA and basically people telling you to do things that you would never, ever do in your right mind? Have you considered that? Yeah, we're, we're definitely part of that. There's a lot of organizations that actually do that. Uh, we have the power to basically do these private, basically, membership programs within food systems, within CAFOs, within herd shares. Especially when we have a USDA processing plant, we don't have to ask for permission. We follow the guidelines of USDA processing. Everything else is up to us. We got to go, guys. Thank you so much. It's so much to come in. Come through the gates of the Beef Initiative.